Glad that you are here. I'm going to move fast because tonight we got a lot to cover. we got an important guest. And uh, there's going to be a little more group participation in various ways. Some ways that we've never done before. All right. Could we have the opening little video clip, please? Now, please pay attention to this. I want you to learn something from it. Okay, now let's practice, all right? Can we play it again? And this time, everybody else join in. I'm gonna unclip this. Oh, oh wait, wait. Can, can we restart that? Sorry, sorry. All right, did you hear that? Okay, not bad for a bunch of amateurs. All right. And now, clip number two. <laughs> Can we do that one again too, please? Okay. Okay. This does have application to tonight's Bible study. We are going to follow words of scripture just a little bit later here. Um, glad you're here. We are talking about the prophets. The prophets, people who God said, okay, go confront. Go tell people what's up. Go speak in my name. <sighs> Yikes. It was a rough world then. It's a rough world now. What's up with this world? Man, every day, every day you're finding out something bad's happening. Um, you know, spring break last week, there were riots in Miami. There were riots on South Padre Beach. There were, there, there were riots a bunch of different places. Um, in Springfield, Springfield, nice, Springfield, Missouri. We're having murders every week, sometimes every day. What, 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 what's up with that? Um, the whole Me Too movement thing, you know, why, why doesn't know me know and why doesn't get away from me, you creep? Uh, why doesn't it have those, those words have meanings? Um, you know, about, I don't know, a year ago or so, I had all the CDs stolen out of my Jeep. CDs, who, who steals CDs? It, the, the world is a mess, okay? The, the world is a mess, but guess what? Guess what, this isn't the first time. Sometimes it's easy to point fingers and say, hey, look at those guys, look at those bad people doing bad things. Whew. But what about us? Yikes, the last several months, We've heard some terrible, terrible stories about people who say they follow God, but have done terrible things. And, and I'm not putting these up here to, to hold up these people. I think it's pretty widespread in America today. And well, not just, just America, but other places as well. People who say, I love Jesus, I wanna follow God. And they're abusing people. All three of these happen to involve sexual abuse. There are other ways people rip people off and, and hurt people. What is up with that? Well, we, uh, we're going to read a lot of scripture tonight, and because you just got back from spring break, and some of you, you know, got some sun, and that makes you sleepy and so on, tonight I want to follow an old tradition that happens in some places, and as we read scripture tonight, I'd like us to stand. So please stand for the reading of the first scripture, which is Micah 1, 2 through 8. Hear you people, all of you, listen, earth, and all who live in it, that the sovereign Lord may bear witness against you the Lord from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads on the heights of the earth. The mountains melt before him and the valleys split apart. The wax, like wax before the fire, like water rushing down a slope. All this is because of Jacob's transgression, because of the sins of the people of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap of rubble a place for planting vineyards, I will pour her stones into the valley and lay bare her foundations. All her idols will be broken to pieces. All her temple gifts will be burned with fire. I will destroy all her images. Since she gathered the gifts from the wages of prostitutes as the wages of prostitutes will again be used. Because of this, I will weep and wail. I will go about barefoot and naked. That part we're not gonna follow. I will howl like a jackal. 
and moan like an owl. Again. Okay, now you may sit back down. Even though a lot of the psalms to me sound like blues songs, and I do have a goal, one of my bucket list things is to have somebody help me turn a bunch of psalms into a blues album. I think that what Micah is saying, Micah the prophet, is wail, howl, moan, because things are so bad, God is not happy with you. And, you know, some of us grew up with this idea, oh, you know, if I say a cuss word, God's going to smack me down, and um, oops, I hit my brother again, you know, God's not going to like that. No, no, no. He's, he's, this isn't talking about breaking rules. What this is talking about when he says, okay, Samaria, you're in a world of hurt. Okay, Jerusalem. We've been talking a little bit about Israelite history. Uh, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem was not just the capital, but also the, the spiritual center of the southern kingdom. And God's saying through the prophet, your whole system's corrupt. Everything that's going here is going the wrong direction. You're going with the flow. Um, here's, here's an interesting thing. The Assyrians, and some of you guys are going, man, I didn't think I'd get this much ancient history at Campus House. It, it matters here. The Assyrians already had kind of their elbow on Israel. And well, Israel had already by this time mostly been taken away on Judah. And what they're saying is, hey, you know what? You people can go about doing your business, uh, take care of things. You can even have your own temple. But we're going to throw a few more gods in it. And the people of Israel just kind of said, well, hey, we got to go with the flow. We don't want to make people mad. We don't want to get unfriended. <laughs> we don't want to get disliked. So we better do what these people are telling us to do. After all, we're special. After all, we're God's holy people, chosen people. Yeah. Remember our father Abraham, God talked to him directly, said, I want you to be my people forever. And, and then he gave us this land, this great land. We love this land. It's our land. Nobody can take it away from us. We wandered off. We wound up in Egypt. God brought us back. He parted the Red Sea for us. And then he, had, he put his dwelling among us. Over there in that temple building, that is God's presence. We're set. Okay? We are God's special people. And he'll always bail us out. Just like he did in Egypt. Just like he did when all the Canaanites and Philistines and everybody was trying to attack us. Just like during the times of David and Solomon when people attacked. God's going to come through for us. Well, but here's the deal. Covenant. It's not a word we use a lot these days, except sometimes during uh, wedding ceremonies. Covenant is an agreement. It's not like a contract where you just sign it and, you know, the, on the such and such day of such and such, I hereby uh, bind myself to. A, a covenant is saying, okay, I, I will do my part and you will do your part. And if either side doesn't do their part, the covenant's broken. And God was still doing his part. Even when he sends prophets to thunder at him and say, what is up with you people? He's doing his part. But they're saying, we don't want to get, you know, too into the whole Yahweh thing. The Assyrians, you know, they, they got their own gods. We got to be tolerant. We got to let this go on. And they actually had moved images into the temple along with the Ark of the Covenant and uh, along with the menorah and, and all the holy things of the Jews. There were gods of the Assyrians. Now, Yahweh is a God of mercy. God is a God of justice. The, the various Baals, the various other uh, gods, they're all about indulgence. They were all about uh, uh, success. And the Jews, God's people, were going right, right for it. Let's go to the next scripture. Let us rise. He, he, he. You know, I'm a teacher. I know how to keep people from going to sleep. <laughs> Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it is in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. Woe to those who plan. No, we read that. Come on. <laughs> 
Oh, I'm sorry, it's only two verses. My mistake. You may sit back down. I, I thought this one went further. In God's model for the world, from the very beginning, all people matter. All people matter. And it isn't, I'm God's people, I've, I've, uh, one of God's people, I've got special privileges. I can take what I want because, hey, it's all God's, so therefore it's all mine. No, God said even back then to take care of the strangers. God said even then to take care of widows and orphans and the alien among you and so on. And these guys, instead of loving on people, were robbing people, even God's people. We're, we're shifting their allegiance from God and their love from people to love for stuff. How could this happen? Well, basically, they forgot who God is. So some of you have heard me talk about this before. But in the time of Israel, as is happening in America now, an awful lot of people have kind of, oh, let's say, remade their vision of God. And let's go to this next screen here. There's, there's a sociologist at Notre Dame who I know somewhat named Christian Smith, who, who did a big study of faith in America back during the uh, 2000s, early 2000s. And he said that it's still hard to find an atheist in America. Indeed, the people who flat say, I don't believe in anything supernatural, four to six percent. But an awful lot of people say, I don't want anybody else telling me what to do. That's why there's so many nuns, you know, in ES not in UNS, um, in, in America, is because people are saying, don't tell me what to do, I'm gonna create my own faith. And, and what Christian Smith labeled this is moralistic therapeutic deism. Now, if you've had intro to religion or religion in America with me, we've talked about deism. You know, it's this belief that there was a, or that there is a great being who created things, set things in motion, but then just kind of kicked back and said, okay, you're on your own now. Um, Deism. An awful lot of people who say they believe in God kind of believe in that God, the one who, you know, maybe created stars and who you ought to say, oh, look at the beautiful wildflowers in California after the fires. That shows there must be a God. The moralistic part is very interesting. The moralistic part says, uh, God's on my side, so I can tell you you're wrong. Everybody wants Jesus in their corner. Everybody wants to use um, some sort of higher power to put the hurt on other people. You know, God doesn't like it when you do that or say that. And in many arguments that you've been in on Facebook and other places, both sides are invoking God. Well, God really does have moral standards, but uh, God's moral standards aren't necessarily yours. Let's go to the third word there, therapeutic. Therapeutic. When Christian Smith and his associates asked people, so why do you believe in God? They said, because I need there to be a God. I, I need God when I'm hurting. I need God when I'm desperate. I need God. Sometimes. Moralistic therapeutic deism. And over the years, I've thought about this a lot. And the, the reason we have that image there and the reason we have, well, the real thing here is because I believe the moralistic uh, therapeutic deism is, is kind of coming up with a spare tire God, okay? Spare tire. How many of you have a spare tire in your car? Yeah, yeah, good, good. How many of you love your spare tire? Oh, okay, we have two. We have two people who love their spare tires. And you know what that means. If you love your spare tire, you could probably tell me right now what brand the tire is up there under your car or in the compartment underneath or bolted on. Do you guys know where your spare tires are? Do you know if it's ever been inflated? Is it a full size? It's one of those little mini jobs. Um, do you love your spare tire enough that when you get a new car, you're going to pull the spare tire off and take it to dealers and go, I need something that fits this. This, this is the center of my world. I, I want a new car, but I can't give up my spare tire. Of course not. Your spare tire is there when you're desperate. Your spare tire, everybody's glad to have a spare tire when they got flat. But the rest of the time, you don't, you don't care so much about it. You don't think so much about it. Very quick story. Um, many of you have seen the red pickup truck I, I drive around sometimes. It was my dad's truck. When my dad couldn't drive it anymore, he passed it on to me. 
And uh, it's a 1999 truck. I just turned over 100,000 miles a while back. That didn't drive it much. But because you didn't drive it that much, the, uh, the tires kind of got rotten on it. Last summer, I was driving it down I-44, 70 miles an hour. Kaboom, right front tire blew out. And uh, hey, I've driven you know, a lot of cars with blown out tires. So I limped it to the, road, to the side of the road. It was a hot day. I was dressed up. I thought, great, get to change a, a tire here. Hey, wait, I've never changed a tire on this before. I think it's probably up underneath. How do I get it out, especially dressed up without getting filthy? Where's the jack? Okay, I gotta make a confession to you. This is so hard for me to admit as a middle-aged American man. Okay, upper middle-aged American man. I had to get out the manual. <laughs> I had to get out the car manual to find the various parts of the jack so I could get my spare tire down. And it didn't match the other ones, and it looked stupid, but I'm still glad I had it, okay? And uh, is that God for you? Is God who you call into action when you got nothing else? When you're stuck by the side of the road? Apparently, by this point, that's where the Israelites were. Now, the rest of uh, uh, Micah 2, if you'll rise again. So didn't they have people who were trying to keep them on track besides Micah? Well, do not prophesy, their prophets say. Do not prophesy about these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. You descendants of Jacob, should it be said, does the Lord become impatient? Does he do such things? Do not my words do good to the one whose ways are upright? Lately my people have rise, risen up like an enemy. You strip off the rich robe from those who pass by without a care, like men returning from battle. You drive the women of my people from their pleasant homes. You take away my blessing from the children forever. Get up, go away, this is not your resting place, because it's defiled. It is ruined beyond all remedy. If a liar and a deceiver comes and says, I will prophesy for you plenty of wine and beer, that would be just the prophet for this people on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights, downtown Springfield, and a host of other places. All right, you may sit that back down. <laughs> Spirit tire gods have their own prophets. And you know what they say? Exactly what people want them to say. You deserve it. YOLO. The prophets of our age don't necessarily always speak in front of a Bible study or work out of a church. Um, these are the symbols of some of our prophets. Uh, you've probably listened to a few of them. Um, you know, they got some, some brothers and, or, and sisters in the prophetic community, Tumblr and, you know, Instagram. Go down the list. You know them all. Well, okay, let's go to the next slide here. We need mercy. Now, I got to tell you this. Mercy is not just simply uh, sympathy. Mercy is not even uh, just feeling for somebody. Mercy is looking at things that are wrong and saying, we, we gotta fix this. Mercy is justice in action. Oh, that's the other word we're gonna talk about in the second part of this text. Mercy is us acting on God's behalf regarding the people he loves. Before we move totally into the next text, I wanna pause for a moment just to mention a recent occurrence that maybe some of you have misconstrued. If you'll go to this next, what about the Methodists? Now, Campus House isn't specifically a Methodist group, although I genetically am 50% Methodist, okay? Um, and and I, can, I can show you on genograms and so on. And a lot of people, you, you may have heard that at their last conference, they, they, this is a, a record of the vote actually, they went for the quote unquote traditional plan. For many, many years, the Methodist Church, which at one point, um, had become, quote unquote, one of the most liberal churches in America, has struggled with this issue of, are we going to take what the Bible says about sexual behavior and so on seriously, or are we gonna you know, just take whatever people wanna do and affirm them in that? It has been something that's taken many years. It is something that they have struggled over. There were three different plans voted on in St. Louis just, what, less than a month ago, or maybe about a month ago. And the plan they came up with said, we are gonna to return to our more uh, uh, traditional roots. 
oh man, it's created a firestorm storm on Facebook and Instagram, Twitter and so on. People are going, they're haters. We thought the Methodists were nice. You know what? They, they didn't say anything about hating anybody. They didn't say anything about throwing people out of the church. What they said, largely due to the influence of the African community among the Methodists, is we want to take the Bible for what the Bible says. We still want to keep loving everybody, but there's certain behaviors we can't say are okay. You know, it's interesting in our culture that sometimes we go with the flow and we, we start letting the votes of likes on social media dictate for us what our, our moral standards ought to be. And, and there's this really odd thing in American culture right now that if you disagree with somebody, then you hate them. That, 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 that's not true. We, we, you know, this whole idea of diversity, this whole idea of tolerance presupposes that people believe different things and do different things. But we're kind of in a day of what I call the new inquisition, where if, if you have the wrong idea, you're not worthy of life. And some of the really hateful things have been said about the Methodists who say, said, we gotta take a stand on what we believe to be true has, has brought down upon them a lot of hate, their direction. Well, let me give you some comparisons. I think most people um, who, who, who are believers would say that, you know, sex before marriage is, is not appropriate. Does that make those people teenophobics? I don't think so. Uh, most people would say that drunkenness is an inappropriate thing. Does that make them drinkerphobics? I think most believers are opposed to corruption. Does that make them politician phobics? Sorry, sorry for the little dig for anybody in political science. What I'm saying here is the prophets among the Methodists have said, even though this is wildly unpopular, look at that vote, um, you know, 56 to 44% essentially, um, even though it's really close, we gotta do what we believe God is telling us to do right. They aren't gonna be standing out with signs saying God hates fags. They, they, aren't gonna, they aren't gonna be doing anything that demeans a single person. But on the other hand, they aren't gonna let them do, they aren't going to approve people doing things they believe are harmful to them. Um, I have lots of stories in part because I have children and grandchildren. And it was a big night when my youngest granddaughter, Maya, who uh, is one and a half, more or less right now, um, when she walked, and it happened to be at my parents' uh, independent living apartment the night she started walking, and it was wonderful. She just kind of boosted her, boosts her little rear up, and she starts toddling, and, and she just makes a, a lightning move for a, an outlet in the wall and tries to stick her finger in it. That's the first thing she does the night she walks. And, and uh, needless to say, multiple family members jumped in and prevented her from getting that really little finger into that really little slot. Why? It's bad for, her, you know? Um, the Bible does not say that, but you can trust me on this. That, that, that's a bad thing for a one-year-old to do. This is what the prophets are about, saying, we gotta listen to God. We gotta make wise choices. All right, again, let us rise for the reading of scripture. Listen. You leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, you who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot. All right, you can sit back down. Um, there were a lot of things that we could say about this, but I wanna ask you, this question, what do we do? What do we say? How do we respond to Christ Church New Zealand? What happened there? I trust that even those of you who never look at anything other than Netflix and, and your social media accounts know that there was a horrendous, horrendous tragedy. A guy went to two mosques altogether, shot about, well, shot exactly, killed 50 people, wounded 50 more people. And the outcry, of course, has been, you know, people are saying, how can this happen? What's going on? And, and I think sometimes when things like this happen, but it didn't happen around here, and it didn't happen in the church, and maybe we're a little worried about how do I respond to this? 
Okay, these are people God loves. Every person who died there, every person who's in the hospital now, is somebody who Jesus loves deeply. We, we need to love them too. I, I don't know if you've noticed this about yourself. You know the Ethiopian plane crash, the Boeing 737 that went down last week, two weeks ago, a week ago, I guess. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you pay more attention when they start saying in, what was it, 31 Americans were on board? What? what? Americans? God doesn't love Americans any more than he loves Ethiopians or Kenyans or the other uh, 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 identities who are there. God loves people. And if God loves people and he tells us to be like him, we need to love people. So how do we respond? Well, not, not yet on that, if we can leave the other one up for a bit. Um, we, we respond with compassion. We respond with horror. We respond with praying for those families. Most of us probably can't go down to Christ Church for the weekend and do personal counseling with these guys. But you know what? That same hatred, that same white supremacist idea is in the Ozarks. It's in St. Louis. It's all over the place. We can't do something there, but we can do something here. Mercy and justice, that's what that last scripture was about. We can take some stands. Let's take the positive stands first. There are Muslim students on this campus who really, really fear, feel, feel fearful. How about you hang out with them? Well, I don't know what to say. Talk to Shannon. She can help you know what to say to students from other countries. But basically, there's students here. They need work on their English usually and sometimes are struggling in classes. You can talk, let them talk about their hometowns and their home countries. They love that. Shouldn't our attitude to all of God's people be that of love and, and outreach? You know, now kind of the negative side. Um, well, okay, l let me say this. Islam, a lot of people don't, don't really understand Islam in America, and they let social media tell them what Islam's about. Um, back when Barack Obama was elected president, I started getting emails from people talking about how he was a closet Muslim and how he was in a sleeper cell, and he was going to become president and then turn America into a Sharia Republic, or not Republic, uh, 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 monarchy and all this sort of stuff. And I refuted those things. I don't do social media. I did all this with uh, email. And, and I studied quite a bit, talked quite a bit about Islam. I refuted a lot of the points they made. And I get emails back from people saying, why do you hate America, Dave? <laughs> I don't hate America, but I don't hate Muslims. I, I, I don't hate people who believe things differently. God created us. God wants us to love each other. We... He, one of Dave Embry's uh, first rules of evangelism is you're, you're never going to win anybody to Jesus who hates your guts or who thinks you hate their guts, okay? Um, we, we need to be salt. We need to be light. All right. I, I'm going long, and I'm sorry about that. So we aren't going to sing Jesus Loves the Little Children. I'm sorry. We can buzz right past that. But I want to share a quote with you from Dostoevsky. At some ideas, you stand perplexed, especially at the sight of human sins, uncertain whether to combat it by force or by humble love. Always decide I will combat it with humble love. If you make up your mind about that once and for all, you can conquer the whole world. Loving humility is a terrible force, not terrible in the sense of bad, but monstrous, it's big. It is the strongest of all things, and there's nothing like it. All right. We're, we're actually going to skip a couple of texts because I talk too much. All right. I do want to go to the next illustration, though. Can we go about two, two slides? That's the one. The basic idea that Micah is saying here is biblical faith does not start with what's in it for me. Biblical faith does not start with what's going to make me feel good, what's going to make me happy, what's going to make me um, the top dog in any given situation. Biblical faith, according to Micah, and all the other prophets says, uh, what does God want? How do we do that? God is not our genie. God is not bound by some sort of contract for us. We too today, according to Romans and other texts, are in covenant with him. But again, that covenant needs to be 
honored on both sides. If we can skip ahead to Micah 6, 6 through 7. This is the last time. One, one more, please. 6, 6 through 7. If you would stand. So things are a mess. How do we fix it? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Let me sit back down. Verse 8 goes on to say no. God wants us to be about justice. God wants us to be about mercy. And that's really hard to do. Illustration here. If you don't have God in your life. Sometimes we think with our kind of own energy, we're going to be really just, we're really going to love people. But we can't do it unless we stay uh, fueled up. Finally, finally, we, we, we get to our guests for the evening. So sorry to keep you waiting. If you'll flash that up there. Yeah. <laughs> We have a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, gentleman on our campus. It is, there are a few places where a university president has the same sort of esteem that he has on this campus. And I gotta tell you, I walked by the wall earlier tonight. I have been here now through 36% of the university's history. I have been here through six of the 10 presidents we've had. Well, five of them, but I know the, know the sixth one. And uh, we've never had a president here who people cheered when he showed up places. But tonight, we've got somebody worth cheering over. Cliff Smart, come on up. So we do Idea Team on Mondays at uh, uh, 1 o'clock. And as we were talking about this text, we, we were talking about being salt, about being light in the world. And I just asked the question. I, I said, who is somebody you guys know? who is really good at being faithful to God in ways that other people see and notice. And the first name anybody said was Cliff Smart. And so I said, okay, let's see if we can get him here. And fortunately, his wife's out of town. He didn't have anything else to do tonight. So he came, yeah. Otherwise, my day would have ended about six. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to campus ministry. Yeah. Well, you, you, you're a college president. You're up weird hours, I too. Am. So, according to 6.8 of Micah, it says, hear what God wants. Here is what the Lord requires of you. To, uh, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. So, Cliff, would you share with them about justice and the ways that shows up in your life, the opportunities you have? Um, so, I... I, I, I... I wrote some words down. I've been thinking about this. Obviously, Dave gave me the text last week. Um, and so, so I, I think um, I think it's, to some extent, I think it's talking about doing the right thing. Um, and I think... I, I, I think it's it's um, I go back to the humble word we're going I think all three of these words are interrelated I think all three of these things connect to each other and and overflow to some extent uh, just like in uh, where Jesus says the greatest commandment he doesn't just list one right what does he say you love your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind love your neighbor as yourself there's a there's a connection there uh, you can't just love God without loving people, and it's hard to love people without loving God, as Amen. you just said. Um, so I think doing justice, it, it, it certainly connects to people. I, I think it means putting other people first. I think it means um, thinking of what other people want over what you want. Um, I, uh, I read a lot of leadership stuff. And uh, just kind of out in the, uh, kind of as a surprise bonus in reading a list of kind of 10 characteristics of leaders, uh, le characteristic number six was the golden rule plus one. 
We all know the golden rule is treat others the way you want to be treated. The problem with that is you may not want to be treated the same way I do. <laughs> you may like different things that I like, but uh, the golden rule plus one is treat people the way they want to be treated. I think it's, I think there's a, a sense of, of um, truth matters, there is truth. I think it's not cheating people. Mm -hmm. I think it's treating, um, making sure um, that if people don't follow that rule, there are consequences. Um, I think it's, it's, um, I think it's uh, living a moral life. Uh, I think it's the tone with which you interact with people. Um, you know, there, I saw a poll recently that said uh, most white people in America, more than half, are angry every day. I found that astounding. I'm rarely angry. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's living a life with thankfulness and um, seeing God's blessing in everything and, and making sure to the extent you can that people are treated fairly and not taken advantage of. Amen. I think that's a piece, you know, I was thinking of another scripture in James that talks about what's true religion, caring for the oppressed, i.e. orphans and widows, uh, living a moral life. And so I, I think... I, I think it's a really overall, I've been rambling a lot, but I think it's mostly a sense of uh, treating people fairly and to the extent you can making sure uh, other people um, um, are not taken advantage of. You know, we did a climate study probably before any of you guys were here. Anyone get the email this week or last week, new climate study? Yeah, yeah let me encourage, so it may have gone in your junk. Um, mine did, had to pull it out. Um, but fill that out because it, it, it actually, people will read it. We're, we'll analyze that data. We did a climate study about five years ago. What did we learn? We learned that uh, people that are not in a majority group don't feel the same sense of, of welcome on our campus. So that could mean you're African American, it could mean you're born in a different country, it could mean you have a different sexual orientation, it could mean you're very conservative, it could mean you're evangelical, it could mean you're Muslim. You know, anyone who perceived they're not in the main group felt less welcome and, and less attached to the university. Well, we wanna, we wanna fix that, right? And so I've had you know, both situations. I've, I've had where a faculty member in a, in a random class stands up the first day of class and just rants about how bad the president is. Well, okay, I'm not a big fan of the president either, but that's not appropriate in an introductory English class, right? Uh, and so we had to take action to stop that. You know, or we have a faculty member who uh, gives an assignment to write about what's the most important thing in your life but tells you you can't write about God. That's not acceptable. We've got to fix that, right? And so a big piece of what I try to do is, is to create a culture and a climate where everyone equally feels welcome and connected to the university, whether you're evangelical or Muslim or nothing, whether you're black, white, or Hispanic, whether you're gay or straight or nothing, whether you're a transgender student. The, the goal is everyone uh, feels has a good experience in the university, gets the education they want, leaves here um, having broadened their horizon and mind, but feeling connected to the university. And we don't just want that for our middle class white gr uh, Greek congregation, right? That's, that's not the goal. We want them to be, we want them included, but we want it broader than that. And so I think that's a, a piece of what doing justice is. Absolutely. And as you said, these are all interrelated, so loving mercy. So one of the translations, I looked at a couple of translations on this, and uh, the New American Standard Bible says to love kindness. Yeah, good. It's one of my favorite words. If you guys follow me on Twitter, and I hope everyone follows me on Twitter, <laughs> at Cliff Smart, one F. Um, I started Instagram a couple weeks ago, too. We'll so. um, get to that. I, uh, um, I, talk, I, I talk about kindness a lot. 
um, because I think how we interact with other people really is says who we are. Um, and so, um, I on Sundays when I do a quote, a lot of times it references kindness. When um, I meet with all of our new employees once a quarter, everyone who's a new employee comes for breakfast, and I visit with them about how how important it is to work at the university no matter what your job is, and I tell them this story. Uh, this guy named Joel Manby became a rich guy, CEO of a big corporation, big corporations, I think he's at SeaWorld right now. Um, uh, tells his story, he's 18 years old, uh, all-state football player, quarterback of his football team, going with his mom to his senior high school football banquet. A couple of freshmen come up to him, also on the team. Hey, Joel, want to talk to him? just ignores him and walks right on by. So they get around the corner and he says, for the first time in his life, his mom jacked him up literally against the wall <laughs> and said, never do that. You just treated those people as if they didn't exist, as if they had no value. When you interact with someone, you either make their day worse or you make it better. And you just made those kids day worse. And so I tell that story and then I say, as you interact with each other, as you interact with our students, the goal is in every interaction to make someone's day better, not worse. Amen. Even if, it, and then I say, especially our students, struggling with a lot of things sometimes, they may not deserve it. Even so, work to make their day better. And I say I don't hit that 100% of the time, but that's the goal. And so I, I think um, that kindness or mercy, particularly when it's undeserved uh, is a really important characteristic. And so when God says, um, Here's, here are the three things I expect you to do, I think that's an important thing. Absolutely. And as we've both noted, we, we, we aren't good enough on our own to keep doing this. On, on our own, we, we run out. We, we get tired. We get tired, we burn out, we compassion fatigue sets in, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How do you stay charged up? How do you personally walk humbly with God? Um, um, you know, sometimes better than others. Sometimes I, uh, the, the tire analogy hit a little too close uh, to home here tonight for me, I think. Um, because sometimes we do lean on God when we're, you know, the plane's bouncing really hard and you want to get to the destination. Um, I, I do think um, for me, the regularly talking to God, uh, I think going to uh, worship experiences like this are important. I think reading scripture is important. I think engaging in people's lives, whether you're a mentor, I'm officially a mentor of a young woman through the network who's you know a 36 year old professional, but I think it's more, more than that kind of thing. I think it's being encouraging to people um, and you know for me I think it's um, walking with God means you talk about God you're not ashamed but that you have a relationship with God um, that that doesn't mean you inappropriately try to squeeze God into every conversation you have that's not what I'm saying but I think there I think there are ways for me for example that that even in my position at a public university that I can talk about God. And so Absolutely. sometimes I give a commencement speech and I hold a list a whole list of things that I've learned since I graduated from college. And one of them is it's important to have a relationship with God. Or you quote scripture as a part of a, a conversation or in a class. And you don't even necessarily have to say you're quoting scripture, but other people will know that you've done that. But I think most importantly, it's, it's uh, um, you do need... Um, you know, so I've had an amazingly busy two weeks, 11 days on the road, 14 hour day yesterday, another 14 hour day today. Um, it wears oh, yeah. you out. Um, you're responsible for the last two hours today. <laughs> um, but, um, um, I mean, for me, I think a part of it is getting away, right? When we saw Jesus did that in the Bible. I mean, for me, at least once a quarter, I just have to get away from everything, and that means going out of town and just um, kind of unwinding. It takes probably a day just to unwind from the phone and, and all the stuff you have to keep up with, and, and um, that's helpful.
Jesus was not well known for keeping the Sabbath all the time. <laughs> but he spent, um, he spent time with God. Right. And he seized it when he could and where he could. And sometimes it was uh, not convenient for others when he did. But we can't run on empty. We can't run on empty. Right. I agree. All right. Would you mind if I prayed for you? No, right no, here I'd, be great. I'd appreciate that. And if the band wants to come up while we're praying, Lord, thank you so much for Cliff Smart. Uh, thank you for bringing him to where he is. Um, I truly believe he's, he's the uh, man uh, we've needed to be president uh, during this time. Father, thank you for his compassion. Thank you for his justice. Thank you for his commitment to uh, grace and truth and kindness. Lord, thank you that he sacrificed some time. He could be doing something way different than this to be here with us. And uh, Father, I ask you to sustain him, to give him supernatural energy, supernatural joy as he goes about all the different duties of the day, some of which are not pleasant, some of which involve very hard decisions, some of which involve uh, very deep challenges. Please give him wisdom. Please continue to give him wisdom. Please continue uh, to, to give him a sense of, of peace that as he is walking with you and and using your wisdom to help make the choices he does that he's not going to go wrong father thank you that he he loves the students in this room and every other student on this campus and thank you that we have the chance to love him back in jesus name amen